everybody. Happy uh, quarantine. <laughs> uh, okay, so attempt number two. Hopefully this time I've started with sound. Please let me know. <laughs> I've become very paranoid. I've checked this out like 10 times and now I'm like looking at the sound, but I'm like, it's working. So sound is working. How are you? Um, I'm doing well. Uh, I haven't left the house in about I need to move. I haven't left the house in about eight days and uh, I've, I'm starting to lose my mind. Um, and I'm drinking a lot of vitamin C, which is what I'm doing. And here I am uh, for yet another live um, movie club. How many people do we have actually live on the stream? Let's, let's um, take a look. Uh, I think we have, it doesn't show here. I don't know where I can tell how many people are with us. Um, but, oh, hey, Neo, Ahmed, everybody. Okay, great, everybody's saying we can hear and see, good. Well, the audio and video is good. I guess we can uh, go ahead. All right, well, how many we have? We have like around six people. That's not a lot, but hey, it's Thursday. Everybody's busy, hopefully staying at home. I don't know, um, but here we are at uh, attempt number two. So last week uh, we did um, uh, Clockwork Orange and we pulled out of the hat Children of Men. Uh, and that was actually very exciting. Uh, Children of Men is maybe one of my favorite movies but I haven't seen it in a long time. I haven't seen it. Last time I saw it was probably like 2009, definitely before 2010, definitely before I graduated from college. And uh, I, uh, I didn't, I thought I, I knew what it was about. I mean, I know what it's about. And I thought that I knew all there is to know about it because I watched it so much in college. I didn't just watch it one time. I like rewatched it like a crazy person because I was obsessed with it because I was obsessed with how it was shot. And it made me fall in love with long takes. And later on as a filmmaker, this has had an, a big effect on me for a very long time. When I make movies, I try to do long takes and I fail at them miserably, but I still really try mostly because of this film and how, how much this, and of course Kubrick is another lover of long takes, but specifically these kinds of long takes that are dirty and on the move and a lot is happening in them. Uh, but I haven't seen it. I've watched a lot and I, I remember it very well in my head. But now when I watched it as a, as a, as a 30 something, in my 30s, there's a lot of that I saw in there that I didn't realize the first time, the first like 10 times, which is very interesting. I saw it from a very rebellious point of view because I was young and rebellious and political and I saw it as an anti-establishment, anti-totalitarian uh, film. I saw it as uh, people, the rise of the people. Those are the messages that spoke to me. But now as an adult, it's actually, it spoke to me on a different level. It spoke to me on the level of hope and also, which was very surprising, on a religious level. This is a very religious movie. and. The idiot 20 year old or eight or 20, yeah, the idiot 20 year old did not realize this, <laughs> did not look at it and say, ah, huh, there's a lot of religion in this movie. I didn't think that. I thought, ah, huh, there's a lot of cool political stuff and hope for the people, you know? Like, now I'm like, wow, there's hope for the future. <laughs> so I, I saw. I saw a lot of that uh, this time around. It was actually a very interesting experience for me. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Let me know. Um, in the comments, if you've seen it before and you're re-watching it, or if you're seeing it for the first time, uh, let me know what you think. Um, that's our film. So uh, let me just start off by a little bit of uh, information about um, Children of Men and what it means. I mean, look, at the end of the day, this is a fantastic film. Uh, nobody can really deny that uh, Children of Men is a movie that when you watch it, it really does grab you. It's a very powerful film. And uh, it, I think it's a little bit ahead of its time. I mean, this movie came out in 2006, directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who now is a big deal. But back then, it wasn't as much of a big deal. I believe he wrote this or was working on it. Around the same time, he did uh, uh, Harry Potter. I think it was Prisoner of Azkaban that he was doing. And he was working on this, and um, he, he wasn't that big, right? Um, but this movie really put him on the map as a director, as a visual director. And a lot of his like stylistic flashes there that we see later on uh, down the line. I mean, if you don't know who uh, Alfonso Cuaron is, um, he's got a, a couple of <laughs> fantastic films. Uh, he's an Oscar winning director. Um, he's done uh, a lot of cool stuff in the last couple of years. Um, uh, Roma being the last one, he's the one who did Roma, which again, utilizes that um, unbelievable, uh, it, like, long takes and things like that, uh, Gravity as well, and of course Children of Men, and yes, it is Harry Potter and uh, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban is what he did, and he brought that dark, edgy feel to Harry Potter, I feel that later on was adapted really well, 
before he came along, the Harry Potter movies were very kiddish, and then he came along and gave it that um, edgy look. So uh, the movie was not really successful at the box office, but it was very popular amongst critics because it's a fantastically well-made film in all aspects, most notably, of course, in its cinematography. And the cinematography of this movie is nuts. Again, like it affects you as a person, but it also really affects you if you are a, f- a fan of film, and it affects you even more if you're a filmmaker. It's like, I was obsessed with, how did they do this? How'd they shoot that? How'd they shoot this? How'd they do this? And I kept researching until this day, till today I was looking at behind the scenes videos just to see how they got that and how they got that moment. It's, it's actually incredible. Um, but I wanna see what you guys are saying. Uh, let me see, so we have, um, uh, first a moment of silence for young Diego. <laughs> Yeah, the youngest uh, man alive. Um, Steven says, I haven't seen it in years. Similar experience of not realizing how much was going on in the film. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy imagery and, and metaphors in there that I did not realize the first time around. I did realize that it was philosophical and it was about humanity and hope, but I didn't see it in the light that I'm seeing it right now as a more cynical, more beaten up adult person. Um, NKAE, I don't know, I'm messing up the name, says, first time watching it, I liked it. Not what I expected at all. The long takes gave me 1917 vibes. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, this like something like 1917, something like Gravity, and something like um, uh, Roma for him, and even uh, something like Birdman, they all take cues from this. This was one of the, I mean, long takes have been done before. Again, uh, you have Stanley Kubrick being the master of long, wide takes. Uh, but he did it smoothly, not so um, not 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 so edgy. Uh, you have, of course, even um, um, uh, Alfred Hitchcock has uh, one full take film, uh, which is Rope. So it's been done, uh, but you know, this is a little different um, his style. And we saw a lot of people adapt it later on. Um, it's a postmodernist look at at film and cinematography that I think is wonderful. Um, Agree with all Neo X Fire says. More things going on than we realize on first viewing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot I want to talk about, and I'm really excited to hear what you guys think. Um, but I want to talk about a lot um, in terms of story and in terms of script. There's some really cool stuff going on with the writing of this film, uh, with the writing of uh, Theo and his journey, his 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 odyssey uh, and his hero journey, sort of and uh, what he goes through and uh, the change in his arc and how he sees the world and then later how it changes him. I think it's just so powerful um, how it takes him from absolute cynicism and hopelessness to pure hope uh, and faith. Faith, again, religiously, if you want to, if you want to say, if you want to see it that way. Um, I want to talk about about the, 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 the inclusion of certain thematic elements like religion, uh, like hope, um, and most importantly, and the cinematography and how they, the cool way they shot things. I also want to talk about the, not just the technical aspect of it. Um, again, as I think it's just incredibly written. This movie does exposition in an unbelievable way, in, in a way that is just incredible. Um, and I actually found a quote from Alfonso Coron talking about exposition. And you know, like my day job, I teach at the university, right? I teach film and uh, I usually, um, I teach screenwriting as well as part of the courses I teach. And one of the classes I do on exposition, um, I usually use the first scene of this film. I make the students read how the script is written. And then I tell them, look at all the elements that are there in the scene, in the opening scene of him walking into the cafe and hearing about Diego and how it gives us the information and the setup of the world and the character himself and everything he does every second until that bomb explodes. Um, I usually explain that in class to the students. So I've rewatched the first scene a lot of times, but now like watching the whole thing has given me that perspective. It's just such an incredible example of effortless exposition uh, because exposition is constantly happening in the film without anybody ever standing up and saying the information out loud, which is just so difficult. If you ever tried to write a film, you'd know that this is one of the most difficult things you can possibly do is to not tell the audience, is to just somehow get the information through through to them in the most subtle ways. And this is something that this movie does very, very well. Um, The film ages very, very well, like the previous one. I I guess you're talking about, um, there's Neo talking about uh, Clockwork Orange. 
Uh, it's a movie about faith, losses, hope, greed, says Neo X Fire. Steven, yeah, he shows you the world. He doesn't spoon feed you exposition. Exactly. So let's start with that. Let's talk about exposition first and then we'll dig a little bit deeper. Um, let's talk about that. So that's the cool thing. Uh, Steven, you're saying that he doesn't spoon feed you exposition. Absolutely. So how does he do it? Do how does he do it? No editing, we're live. Um, the way that he does it is. The exposition of the film is constantly in the background. And this also goes to talk about the unbelievable production design that is in Children of Men. Unbelievable. I believe it's nominated for production design. Probably should have won. I don't know what it lost to, but oh my God. There are so many elements in the background that are constantly, constantly telling us about the world that we live in, right? Starting with that first opening cafe scene where you have people just staring at the staring at the screen. I love that there's so many animals in this film. Um, and, I, and there's a lot of, I mean, that's a question to you guys. There isn't, I think there isn't a single scene that doesn't have animals in it. There isn't. Um, whether it's dogs, cats, goats, sheep, uh, cows, um, even like in the final scene, in the climax, when they're in the build, trying to escape the building, there's chicken. There's always animals in there. And I don't know, sometimes I feel like there is, that that is sort of biblical maybe, but also I feel like because human beings um, care for animals in this world because, you know, humans are infertile, they don't have children, so they, they have to take care of something. So maybe they sort of fulfill that need because everybody has animals. And in that opening sequence or opening scene when they're in the cafe staring at the death of baby Diego, a lot of people are holding dogs and he walks out, a lot of people are walking dogs because they don't have children, so maybe they have pets instead. Um, Steven says Expo is tricky. Uh, Erica uses a good word in incident. You used another good description, exposition in the background. Yeah. Oh, what did Erica say? Yes, that's the first thing I noticed how all the details of the word are given incidentally. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the first sequence, you see people looking up and you see people just staring at the screen and they're all middle aged. There's no young people at all. And then you hear Diego died. He's the youngest person in the world, died at the age of 18. Then you see Theo walk in. And you see, the cool thing about Theo is that he walks in and he just, he doesn't care. It's like something so destructive to people has happened and it's a reminder of their loss of hope because before Diego was alive, Diego represents future and it's dying and they're looking at it and realizing this. Except Theo doesn't seem to really care, just takes his coffee and leaves because he's, he's a veteran of hopelessness. He, he, he gave up a long time ago and he says it to Michael Caine, who plays an incredible character, by the way. I love his character in this film, uh, Jasper. Um, he tells him that, you know, the world went to crap way before infertility happened, you know? And again, we know that he lost his child even earlier than that. So he lost the world a long, long time ago. Um, and that's also there in the beginning of the scene, how he walks away from the from the cafe and then you see the world you see these like uh, very um, um, 1984 dystopian uh, government controlling um, you see everything is dangerous you see people like driving TikToks and and things because you know the world's economy has been destroyed because there's no young people to work and you know you know make the, the economy you know strong and powerful so uh, you see that you see the world they're living it's dirty of course and damp and dark and depressing of course and everybody's depressed and uh, dragging themselves along so it's just really it's really incredible uh, you see so much about the rest of the world even though we never leave it right we know what happened in new york we know that something really bad happened at some point we see in the news like a, a mushroom cloud over new york so probably they they had like a uh, uh, a nuclear attack we we see that uh, all the other countries have collapsed and we see that refugees are coming in because other countries have collapsed and how they're being treated we see like through windows when he's uh, the whole every time every time we're with theo somewhere in a location the camera does this little pan and it shows us out the window what is happening outside and that just speaks volumes about the state of the world and everything that's in it and it's just incredible exposition they really put you in in that place without even thinking about it for one second. I mean, Alfonso Cuaron is, is really crazy. Um, let me see. Um, sorry, my connection got weird, Neil. That's okay. Uh, Steven says, I didn't notice about the animals at all. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I still, I don't really know because I just noticed it for the first time now. I didn't like research. I didn't have time to research it, but there's an animal in every scene. I noticed it somewhere towards the middle of the film because I love animals and I just paid attention. Then I'm like, why is there an animal in every scene? Is it a biblical thing? Is it, I mean, we can't, 
we can't refute the fact that how 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 religious this movie is um, in its themes about hope and also in its themes about you know the miracle child and how the birth of a miracle child brings home back uh, hope back to humanity and it's all about faith not knowing whether or not something is real or happening the whole them looking for tomorrow and looking for the human project it's about the search of something that's not tangible that is theoretical but they still have hope um, the pregnancy the girl even when she shows him her her belly for the first time she's standing in the in the barn which is sort of very close to the manger for for Jesus Christ he even says Jesus Christ when he sees the belly so there's a lot of um, re- religious imagery even in even like you have Islam you have people in uh, in the in the camp uh, chanting Allah Akbar and you see like Allah and like a lot of uh, even uh, Muslim religious imagery like it's, it's just so much religion in there um, it's actually pretty cool um, let's see um, uh, Stephen says and his indifference saves him Ex- that's true that's true we'll talk about that when we talk about his personality yes that he the fact that he's indifferent makes him not stick around in the cafe to look at the screen um, which is uh, which when he leaves he leaves quickly and all of the people who cared and stayed inside died to a bomb so we see that his indifference or his apathy um, saves his life um, and it just enables him you know it enables him to not care until you know our inciting incident or something happens that forces him to care you know so yeah that's an interesting point Stephen um, let's see uh, Stephen also says yes this was the first time I saw Michael Caine playing a role so out of character yeah he's like smoking weed and stuff and farting it's, it's pretty cool Neo, uh, one thing I love about the film is we're very, very close to a world that's like it. The visionary predictions in this film are insane. Um, can you elaborate? What, what, what do you mean? <laughs> the world isn't like that now. I would, I wouldn't, I hope not. I mean, I think there's still hope for us. I mean, maybe you know they had like a, a flu that killed off a lot of children, including his his son. So, you know, Corona. <laughs> But I don't know. Uh, how how do you think it's uh, it's I mean I'm not disagreeing but I want to know exactly can you give me examples of how close is it how close is it in predicting the future? Um, Stephen says I noticed that too about the barn scene yeah it's uh, very very biblical. Um, children of men son of man well yeah well children of men is actually from the Bible I found out um, from Palm 90 I think I. I'm not Christian, I don't know the words, but hey, if you guys can research it, put it in there. Uh, there's a quote in the Bible that has the, the phrase children of men, and that's where that um, comes from. Um, so yeah, so the exposition, again, is, is something really, really cool. I want to share with you guys um, this uh, very interesting quote from Alfonso Coron that I found where he talks about exposition, which I found very interesting. Um, here's what he says. He says, because again, there's a lot that's actually not explained. He explains a lot of things, but for example, he never, we never actually know what the reason for infertility is. We do in the book that this movie is based on. I haven't read it, but I read on it. Uh, but the movie doesn't explain it. There's a lot that he doesn't explain. And like, like you said, uh, um, Enrique UAE, or I don't know what your name is. Um, he says that uh, it, he tries to make it incidental, like you said, which is a very good point. Um, he says... Uh, that he generally does not like expository film. He doesn't like information dumps, which unfortunately, especially in mainstream cinema, there's a lot of it. And it personally gets on my nerve because I personally don't like expository dumps as well. So he says, um, there's a kind of cinema I detest. This is Alfonso Cuaron, the director. There's a kind of cinema I detest, which is a cinema that is about exposition and explanations. It becomes a medium for lazy readers. Cinema is a hostage of narrative. And I'm very good at narrative as a hostage of cinema. I like that, that term, hostage, like keeping the narrative or the information hostage, not giving it to us straight away, keeping it you know, at bay, keeping it trapped and letting us maybe seep, seep some of that information to us gently, incidentally, um, um, in, in very small doses. I like that. And I see now, now when I look at a lot of his films, I see that he really does do a lot of subtle exposition in a very in, incredible way. But I don't think it's been done better than, than Children of Men. I mean, you, you, you can feel free to, to disagree with me, but I don't think it's been done better than Children of Men. I, I just In terms of exposition, it's just unbelievable. The amount of information we get in the background is just so much like... There's like four or five films happening <laughs> in the background. And again, look at that unbelievable production design. It's just part of it. I think the production design for this film is incredible. I'm insane that it didn't win uh, an Oscar for it because it's, it's nuts. You know, there's especially like, for example, I, I was looking at the scene uh, where he is kidnapped 
um, the first time when Julianne Moore kidnaps him and uh, tries to talk to him and they put him in a room full of newspaper have you actually have you guys tried reading the stuff that's on the newspaper it's nuts okay there's so much this they had to do this you know none of this newspaper none of these newspapers are real uh none of these articles they actually had to make every single newspaper in that room which is insane so here's some of the stuff that 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 like that you might find on there um they have uh let me see what do they have i'm trying to see here it's a little small um where is it uh age doesn't matter um, immigrants protest against government and racist policies. Um, forget to something more, which is <laughs> interesting. Julianne Moore is in that scene. There's so much that you read in newspapers throughout the film. Uh, I wrote some of them down. Um, they have uh, raid nabs refugees weapon cache. Africa devastated by nuclear fallout. U.S. troops full attack. Extremist explosion at a right royal ripoff. Charles should be thrown out. King Charles. Mil militias, militias, sorry, militias occupy Cincinnati. Like, there's so much information. This world is so interesting. Chaos in refugee camps. Fertility drug kills. So they tried at some point doing fertility drugs and started killed people. Surgeon arrested for fertility drugs. Uh, hormone attacks, violent reaction. That's really interesting. 100 suicides, nation in denial. That's actually very interesting. The whole concept of suicide, um, going into the theme of hope. I want to talk about that a little bit, the theme of hope. But before I go into that and talk about those suicide kits, let's see what you guys are talking about. Um, let's see. Um, Steven says, I like that they don't explain the cause. In a way, it's irrelevant why the world falls apart. What, all that's important to know is that it did fall apart. Yeah, that is correct. I agree with you. Um, that's true. Okay, so um, Neo X Fire says, so religious things, terrorism, immigration, dictation, dictatorship, parentship. Uh, what else was there? I guess those are things that you feel that the film um, sort of is close to our future now. I mean, this film was 2006, so that's exactly 14 years ago. Damn, that's a while back. So it's pretty close, I would say. Uh, Neo says, at the time, this was supposed to be a dark view of the future. This is sort of coming to fruition. Maybe not extensively, but it's all there. I mean, well, not infertility, but you know, less people want to have kids now. So there is that, you know, and the world is a little bit more gloomy and cynical, I guess. Uh, government control, I guess, is something as well. Yeah, sure, I see it. Um, but here's the thing. This is what I liked about this film and what I found very appealing right now is its emphasis on not just hope. We were talking about how, how much it is about hope and faith. That's true. But it's about hope in the darkest, bleakest of times. And technically, I mean, for a film that's about hope, this movie is so depressing. Like, it's not a movie I can watch all the time. As much as I love it, it's just so dark, and depressing, my God. But it is one of those ideas of uh, light in the darkness, right? In the absolute darkness, that's where you can find the light. And that it's so powerful um, to be able to um, have hope in such a dark, dark time, which I really like about this film. Um, and it's really displayed very well in the main character, in the character of uh, Theon. And, uh, and his, 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 his lack of hope, his unbelievable hopelessness in the beginning of the film, and how much that changes and how he becomes a symbol of hope towards the end, uh, I mean, you can't have better than a, a character arc that's completely 180 degrees and you see that. Um, uh, Steven says, I hope the next film is a little bit lighter. Yeah, I know. It's We've been getting this two dystopian films. Like We started the first two films with dystopia, but I really like that. I mean, we are now in a time where hope is very important. I mean, this whole corona thing, uh, many of us have been quarantined for a while. I, I've been here for eight days and I'm starting to lose my mind. It's really, really frustrating. Um, and I mean, it's... It's, it is the time to hope in the darkest time, to somehow find a way to hope that things can get better, that not all hope is lost and that humanity is not doomed. And that's the cool thing about his character. Hey, William, thanks for joining us. Uh, so I want to talk about hope in the film and, and how it's represented, because um, I think it's very good. Like one of the cool elements about the movie is the presence of the suicide kids, right? The, the I forgot what they were called, quintessential, quinty something. Um, where they have uh, these kits that the government provides you. They provide you with a comfortable way to commit suicide. So clearly they were saying in one of those art articles in the, that are pasted in the background that there's a lot of suicides happening. So the government was like, you know what? We might as well make it comfortable for them. We can't stop them from killing themselves. And that's the thing. Suicide is, I think, 
the most ultimate form of giving up hope, especially in the future, right? That's it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can't give up hope more than ending your life. So I love that the government as well has subscribed to the concept of lack of hope. Even the government itself is like, there's no hope. There's no hope in humanities. There's no hope in, in, in trying to bring uh, refugees from other countries and save them. No, put them in camps, put them in uh, cages like animals um, and give the people uh, a comfortable way to lose hope because losing hope is just now part of life, you know? So I think it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. Uh, Neo Xfire says, I like that Theo did not become an action hero by the third act. It was good his character stayed the way he was. Yeah, he never touches a gun huh, in the whole film. He never touches a gun. He never shoots anybody ever. And there's something very interesting about about Theo as Joseph or as 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 sort of the the, the caretaker of, of hope um, and there's something there's something I want you guys to think about I, I noticed it today I also don't really have an answer for it but I thought it was very interesting that they they have a lot of emphasis on his feet right on the fact that he starts out barefoot and they make it they, they make sure we see it he starts out barefoot at some point his feet are being washed in uh, Jasper's house and he switches to um, slippers, sandals, right? And then he switches to uh, modern shoes. And I thought that was interesting, these transitions of, of I guess, humanity uh, and the modern age going from barefoot to sandals to shoes. I thought it was very interesting. And um, yeah, it has a lot of, and again, it's also a bit of a religious symbol, you know, washing the feet and things like that. Um, I'm a big fan of, Neo says, I'm a big fan of tragic characters that die, but somehow that tragedy is uplifting. Yeah, because it's a sacrifice. And again, sacrifice is the up. So death, okay, look at it this way. Why does Theo sacrifice himself at the end? Because both deal with death, right? The kits and the suicide and dying out of sacrifice. Those are two things where you sort of choose to die. But they are the opposites in thematically. Both of them are the opposites of each other because one of them represents death by hope and one of them is death by loss of hope. To sacrifice your life to save something is the ultimate form of hope in the future. You have so much hope that even if you're not here, something good will happen down the line because you died. When suicide, on the other hand, is death by complete loss of hope, right? So that's why we see those two elements there. A lot of characters sacrifice themselves and die in the process of getting this child um, to the ship of tomorrow let's see um ahmed says when he went to see his brother he told him that what's the point of all this considering no one will see it in a hundred years yeah i mean art you know art is 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 something that you completely give up on if you don't have any hope or connection to humanity it's the ultimate form of expression of humanity and we talked about that last week with uh, um, clockwork orange and how important art is to our human expression because it's something only we can do animals don't do art you know and when you give up on it you're kind of giving up on humanity and the world has given up on it um, Stephen says yeah because his death was meaningful in the end and he went from having no purpose to having real purpose X Neo X fire says it was impressive and all quiet in the building until one idiot fired a rocket launcher <laughs> yeah, that 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 scene technically is is actually extremely ex in, impressive um, yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely crazy. Um, okay, so here's the cool thing about Theo, Theon's character and his relationship to Hope um, and why his death at the end is so fulfilling and sad, but bittersweet. So when we first meet Theon, again, he's somebody who, like we've said a lot, he's lost hope and all that stuff. But um, the cool thing, if you want to write a good character and you want to, like, ha they have a really nice arc, a character arc, they have to have a belief about the world that, that is wrong. Okay, and they have to believe that so hard that towards the end, the actions that happen in the film force them to not believe that lie, right? To change their mind about it and believe the truth, okay? So in our case, in this film, what is the lie that Theo believes? Theo believes that humanity is doomed. There is no hope in saving it. That caring about humanity or, or having hope, having hope in humanity specifically, is foolish and it's gonna get you killed like those guys. Um, in the cafe and that's the thing in in good hero stories the hero at first whatever uh, false belief they have about the world is actually enabled in the environment they're in so they're not forced to change their mind they continue to believe the wrong thing that they're believing in which is holding them back from becoming better people and a good story and a good character arc is one that pushes them to find out that what they believe is wrong and you do that by completely destroying their world this is what happens to him and you know this reminded me of very similar stories 
um, uh, my husband actually pointed this out while we were watching and I'm surprised he hasn't pointed it out in the comments which is The Last of Us, the video game which I'm also replaying <laughs> there's a lot of dystopia in my life right now so The Last of Us, if you guys have ever played it is about a man who's saving a girl in the zombie apocalypse and the girl is the hope of humanity because she gets bitten and doesn't turn which might mean that she is hope for a vaccine or a cure um, and he has a connection with her he had a daughter that died and now he's taking care of her and she reminds him of his daughter very similar to this, huh? very similar to this and again he has he's somebody who is self-serving has forgotten about anything and he believes the lie that it's okay to just protect yourself because he lives in a dystopian world where you have to not trust anybody and not care about anybody in order to, to survive and then she comes in destroys his world and pushes him to believe a different version and then he's willing to give up everything to save her right so The Last of Us is incredible, Steven says, yeah. Another film that did this very well, and like, there's a very nice comparison between that and this film, and, uh, and I was reminded of it as well, is Logan, right? Logan has a very similar thematic uh, story, right? And storyline where you have Logan who's not, he's given up on the hope, not the future of humanity per se, it's the future of the mutants, right? Because the mutants are dying. Like instead of humans here, humans are going extinct because women can't give birth. In Logan, it's mutants are going extinct because nobody has any mutant powers anymore. And then in comes this girl, right? X-27, who uh, happens to have mutant powers. And like right at the end of act one, um, it kind of comes in and um, she crashes his world and he watches people like Dr. X die in the process of saving this girl, the hope for mutants. Same thing with The Last of Us. The character The Last of Us watches people die for her, for Ellie. And here, same thing. He watches Julianne and other characters sacrifice himself and the nurse that's with him sacrifice herself for uh, for to, to disprove the lie that he has convinced himself, which is it's foolish to have faith and it's foolish to have hope, which is not true. Okay, what are we talking about? Uh, the parallels, Ahmed Sulaiman. The the parallels are so much. I honestly think that the Last of Us is based on this story. Well, I mean, look, it's an odyssey. There are a lot of similar um, elements uh, in the character's journey, the refusal. Um, the MacGuffin, protecting the MacGuffin. So it's actually not just in those three movies or, 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 or media. There's a lot if we, if we search. Um, Neo says, I wonder if we knew Jesus was going to be born today and he was going to change the world. If humans would act like this, try to hunt the baby so they'd have control over it. Oh, 100% that would happen. 100. You, you're going to see it now, soon, uh, when, uh, the, when the vaccine, hopefully, inshallah, the vaccine comes out for corona people are gonna try to utilize that either politically or financially and economically or both we'll see who's gonna get the cure who who's gonna like how are they gonna distribute it to people upon which which basis who, who's gonna pay for it? you know what i mean this stuff is gonna happen soon so you'll see that's a terrifying idea but probably yeah uh but yeah it's very similar so again so in the end towards the end i like that um Theos, he sacrificed, we see him in the beginning, we see that his belief and the lie that he tells himself how he has given up on the world and on humanity specifically and that caring about it is stupid, and it's going to get you killed and then in the end he completely flips to uh, 180, complete 180 and that's a fantastic 100% full arc um, and we see it in a lot of cool character stories. What else we got? Enki says, Enki, I don't know how to say your name at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, interestingly, in 2006, there was a Masters of Horror episode that was kind of similar, except it took a much bleaker and nihilistic turn. Mm, interesting. I've never heard of it, so I don't know what that is. But that's interesting. It's, around the, it's the same year, so... Hmm. Um, William says, do you think it is a reflection of our times now, meaning in post-industrial nations, our birth rates are below re replacement level? Yeah, I think it's true. I think, I think it's... I mean, there is that sentiment of cynicism um, that is very rampant right now in the world. And you know, and again, more people, more and more people are choosing, forget infertility, by choice, they're choosing to not have children. And I've heard this from a lot of people saying, what kind of, I don't want to bring kids into this world. Like, I've heard people say this, you know, imagine how it is in, in nations that are at uh, worse conditions than where we are here in the UAE. I mean, we're doing really well. But imagine there's a lot of people around the world who are just very cynical and uh, don't want to have children, don't want to bring children into this world. I've heard it from multiple people. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, definitely, this is there are mirrors there that the guys were talking about earlier. 
Um, Stephen says, William, there are several factors that apply here, though I can't pretend to understand them all. Um, Enki says, I'm Yusuf, by the way. Nice. That's an easier name. <laughs> I'm going to say Yusuf from now on. Your YouTube name is very confusing. Okay. William Ruffin, ironically, it is people that come from the so-called third nations that are having kids. Yeah, because, I mean, this is going to a very interesting discussion <laughs> about third world countries and why uh, people of lower class have more children. I mean, because they're more instinctual and our instinct is to uh, reprocreate. Um, and I guess they rely more on instinct. And in, the more intellectual you become, the more existentialist your, your thought patterns become. And you think of very, you think of the big picture a lot and the consequences of the choices that you make. And then you're a little, a little bit more careful about the choices you make. I mean, that's my, at least that's my argument. You can argue against it. Uh, Stephen says, statistically, as education level rise, birth rates drop. That's true. That's what I was saying. So intellectualism kind of is anti-reproduction in a sense because you're considering the future and the repercussions of your actions a lot more. And usually when we start thinking that way, we're more careful and we're more hesitant in our choices. Um, Neo X Fire. Well, I'm comparing Corona to the happening. Earth is healing itself by locking humans inside. The ozone layer is back. That's, that's, I mean, that's an interesting way to look at it. Again, there were people, part of the exposition of the background of this movie is that you see a lot of people uh, 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 like some of the people a lot of people are doing protests and signs in the scene there's a big religious group at one of the scenes where he's walking and you see this uh, large group of protesters um, that are uh, saying that uh, God has uh, forsaken us uh, and uh, and that like this is the result of that uh, that God is doing this to us because we are we, we've forsaken him and things like that um, so yeah, so again, this is part of the really unbelievably impressive production design um, of this film. There's a lot of technical things in this movie that are very, very impressive outside of story and theories and theme. Uh, again, one of them is the camera work. Um, I mean, you guys were talking about the third scene, the, the, the climax and the big action sequences of them running around. That's incredible, yes, but that's actually not my favorite technical like achievement of the movie. Uh, actually, my favorite scene and my favorite technical achievement is the scene inside the car uh, when Julianne Moore gets killed. That is just, I was obsessed when I first saw this movie back in college. I was actually obsessed with how, with how they shot it. I was like, how did they shoot this movie? How did they shoot it? How, what, what, what kind of equipment did they use? And eventually I found out um, the rig that they used, which is really, really impressive. They used this uh, camera that is, so the, the car itself is being driven. It's not green screen, by the way. Uh, it's not a green screen sequence, which is why it looks so real and intense. It's crazy. Uh, they built this uh, two axis camera that moves left and right, front and forward inside the car. The car has no roof. So there's that space on top. There's like a big sort of tent like space on top where the camera is hanging and drops down. Um, uh, they, which is, of course, there's no cameraman in there. It's all remote controlled. The car itself is on a big rig that is being driven by somebody. Uh, and, uh, and the doors and the windows. Um, and the seats actually uh, were rigged to move as well to make space for the camera. It's just incredible. I think they shot this, I don't know, six times or something. It's like most of the scene is one take and it's absolutely incredible. In the scene of the, of the building and them running around, going out and in, there are actually some fake cuts in there, uh, interestingly enough. Um, but in this this one i find like because it's such a confined space and such a like, technical there's nobody holding the camera there's nobody running there's you know it's just there's no room for mistakes or error there are some cgi effects on the windshield of the car for example the front windshield of the car yeah sure but otherwise it's just i think it's it's one of it's just it's one of like my favorite long take shots ever <laughs> ever i just i find it really 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 incredible uh what are you guys saying let's see Okay. Uh, Neox Neo Fire says, yes, that car scene was done impressively. Steven says, I love that scene for a different reason. In so many shows and films, a death of a main character is more formal and drawn out. Interesting. Uh, that's, I agree. Um, it is very uh, happenstance uh, when she dies. And, uh, and I like the fact that there was no time to mourn. Um, because that's, in, in a situation like this, 
in a bleak situation like this where people are on the run and in danger, um, there's no time to stand and mourn and be emotional, which is more heartbreaking because when characters are allowed to grieve, um, they get their catharsis, you know, and in this scene, Theon does not get his catharsis. He walks away and starts to cry later after they run and escape and everything. He wants to cry for her. He loves her and he can't. They call him and they have to go back on the run. And it's really funny, like, poor Theon never finishes a cigarette in this movie. <laughs> Every time he starts to, to like, smoke a cigarette, um, <laughs> he kind of, um, he gets called away and stuff. So it's very funny. Um, Yusuf says, oh yeah, that car chase scene was so visceral, you know, even watching it on my tiny tablet. I can't believe you're watching a movie on a tablet. That's crazy. That's crazy. I can't do it. I can't. I have to watch it on my on a TV, like 65 inch. Like, I gotta. I cannot. I cannot with that. On a tiny tablet, I could feel the impact of the blows. Um, Steven says her death happened in the scene without any of the fanfare. It just happens and we have to deal with it and run as much as they do. Yeah, which is very tragic, very, very, very heartbreaking. Um, so yeah, so I love that scene a lot. Um, Neo X Fire, it's the same death scene in 1917 when the soldier dies and the other just continues with the mission. Yeah, I mean, like now that you guys mention it, I do see these parallels to, um, to, to that film because um, it's very interesting. Like it's a pretty cool, cool um, use of uh, putting you in this, in the moment, putting you in the, in the chase, uh, putting people in the, in, in the, in the thick of it. In, in, and the madness of it um, and honestly like the cool thing about it is that I, this is why I started thinking of The Last of Us is it actually felt like a video game in a lot of parts you know especially because of the the camera movement because that's how it would happen in the video game and a lot of scenes in The Last of Us play out like this where you're running around between buildings and hiding from the big tanks coming in and you look back and you see like Ellie hiding like this this stuff happens in this movie a lot and I thought it was actually incredible um, really nice touch there so uh, I really liked how it was done and it just really puts you in there. It's just incredible. This movie is so underrated, you guys. I mean, I'm so glad. I don't know if anybody here has never seen it and watched it for this. If you have, let me know in the comment section because it's actually pretty cool, but I want to know. Um, otherwise, um, if you're re-watching it, uh, make sure other people watch it. I always tell people about this movie because I think it's really good and I think it's really worth watching. And I think it's criminally underrated. It's just so beautiful. Um, I would especially like, you know, there's a scene, and visually there's a lot of motifs. I mean, it's not just cool, and it's not just um, like visually impressive in terms of technicals. Also, in terms of storytelling, it's extremely, extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, we were talking about all those um, religious, uh, religious imagery and things like that. I especially like the scene where they go to the school. Again, some corona. <laughs> <laughs> mirroring there where the schools are empty but now they're they've been abandoned for a long time for 18 years or more and uh, and I love how she's outside and she's singing and she's playing on she's a representation of childhood like she represents it and she's just uh, playing on a swing and he's there and uh, there's a moment I don't have the image of it but there's a moment where um, he's standing and talking to the nurse lady and you see her inside a a, a, a circular crack in the in the window and that looks like a womb like it looks like a pregnant woman's belly and it's actually used in some of the uh, some of the marketing material interestingly enough um, and I think that's just these visuals like they're just so beautiful and they're so impressive it's just absolutely incredible um, oh Yusuf is saying that this is the first time he's watched it honestly when I first heard of the movie it sounded a bit sappy the way it was described <laughs> to me so I wasn't interested I'm glad I watched it I'm glad I'm glad I mean I don't know how it would be sappy it's it's incredible uh, but it's very very interesting uh, I'm glad that you you watched it because of me I will take full credit for you watching this amazing movie I like taking credit for these things so you're welcome <laughs> so yeah I mean it's really really fascinating I really liked it um, I'll open it up to you guys if you have any other uh, comments or is there anything else you want to discuss in the film um, it's incredible we, cinematography, writing. I, I especially love the writing of this film, the directing and the visuals, um, and the motifs, and uh, what it what it has to say about suicide and sacrifice and hope in humanity itself, um, and art. A little bit of I mean trivia, by the way. This movie has one of my favorite paintings, um, if you guys care. Um, which is, there's a lot of Picasso, and I love Picasso because of my favorite artist, and one of my favorite paintings is feature, featured heavily in this movie. It's called Guernica, uh, and uh, it's a political um, painting, 
and it's there in his brother's house. I actually love this scene literally because of that. And also because when they're standing, again, so much is happening in the background of this movie. That's the coolest thing about it. If you guys ever rewatch it again, really, just don't, you can literally rewatch the movie and just look at the background. Don't look at what's happening on the foreground. Just the background of this film has, has it's another film on its own, right? Um, and there's one, one moment where he's standing and talking to his uh, brother and there's like a pig flying. That's, that's, um, um, that's a, a Pink Floyd uh, album cover, for example, that's also there um, in the background. So in this scene, so I like this scene. I like the references in the back. There are things that I like. I like Pink Floyd and especially I like this painting. It's my favorite Picasso painting and it's in this movie. That's why this movie actually never left uh, uh, my brain. Um, let's see. Uh, Steven says the language of this world feels very distinctive. Um, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by the language of this world? Do you mean like what the way that people speak? Um, Neo says, well, if you want to see Clive Owen with guns, let's watch Shoot Him Up. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I like it. Um, I, I like I like the fact that he never, never shoots anybody. He never actually commits any violence himself. Um, but he's a better man than, we, than he thinks he is. And I think that's really, he's a hero. He's a hero and he's set up as a hero which is very, very important and very, very effective. Um, and I like it a lot. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, he saves the day. And you see it, by the way, in Clive Owens. I mean, we didn't talk about the performances. I mean, yeah, Michael Caine is amazing in this film, but also, man, Clive Owen is, again, very underrated, very underrated. And his performance in this film is amazing. I love how you just, just compare the look in his eyes, and he does it all with his face, just in the beginning, how, how apathetic he is and how hopeless he is towards the world. Like literally you just like look at his eyes and he's just, he has absolutely no purpose, absolutely no hope, you know, it doesn't care, doesn't care about anything at all. Um, and then later on in the film, everything changes for him. Uh, the moment uh, he sees that baby, it's just something clicks and we see the real him, you know, the him that has been buried uh, under years and years um, of pain and disappointment and like, absolute pain there's a man who lost his child and watched the world collapse like there's so much pain i mean even right now there are studies that are saying us during the corona time we're all experiencing a form of grief you know uh but then later later on especially in that third scene yeah the the them going into the building and out and and the and the special effects and the long take there is very very impressive but i actually like one of my favorite things about that scene is just watching it and looking at clive owen's face and the 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 purposeness that he has and and the the affirmation of of his purpose and his the opposite of of hopelessness the opposite of apathy actually caring actually having the drive because he believes he's doing something so big and so important more important than him he is trying to save humanity that he has given up on and it's just a powerful performance from him uh uh chiodel edge four as well as in this film and he's really good so there's a lot of great performances the girl it's just i mean I, that, I can't criticize this movie. It's just, it works. It works in all aspects, you know? So it's a fantastic film. I'm glad we picked it. Um, I'm glad we got to talk about it. Um, and it's actually uh, impressive. Hi, Ahmed. You're a little late. <laughs> you kind of, you're at the end of the stream. You have to go back to the beginning. But hey, you're here because right now we're going to pick our next movie, okay? Who's ready for our next movie? Steven wants something that's a little bit happy. I don't know <laughs> if we're going to get that. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna try. So um, are you guys ready? Uh, before I do that, since you guys are here and not a lot of people showed up today, I think, but um, I'm very glad that you guys did. Um, just sound off in the comments. I want you to put some suggestions. Um, Stephen, try to give us something hopeful uh, or less gloomy. Um, I want your suggestions to put in the hat um, before we do the draw. So sound off in the comment section. Give me your suggestions, and I'm gonna write them and I'm gonna put them uh, on the hat. And let's see what we have. Uh, and I'll add them to the hat and I'll pull and maybe we'll get some of your. Please don't be a sad movie. Well, give me, you were saying, please don't be a sad movie. Well, give me something positive. Give me something positive and we'll put it in here. And hey, maybe, maybe we will get it. <laughs> we do need something. We do need something positive. I mean, like, enough. <laughs> we need something very, very happy. So let's see what we have. So start Moonstruck. Okay. I've actually never seen Moonstruck, so there you go. Let's put that. Okay, let me add those. All right. Let's see. I'm going to put Moonstruck.
uh, Ahmad Sulaiman wants silence of the lambs. It's already in there. It's in there. And that's not, that's not happy. Is it? Is it a positive movie? I don't know. Moonstruck. All right. Goodwill Hunting. Mm, that's a nice movie. Definitely. Good Will Hunting. Okay. Kurosawa, Neo says. A Kurosawa. Does Kurosawa have anything positive? Well, can you pick a Kurosawa movie so I can put it on here? Give me a Kurosawa movie. Let's do. Let's do it. Let's hope for something not gloomy. I mean, it's tough. Most really powerful films are, are deal with you know really really dark themes. I guess it just happens to be that. So Street Fighter, no, <laughs> no, good films. This is a movie club where we appreciate cinema. I want cinematic films, just like films that Scorsese likes. Cinema, <laughs> real cinema. So no. Share. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Moonstruck, yeah, Cher won an Oscar for it. That's true. I know of the film. I, I've just, I've never seen it, so I don't know. All right. Okay. So, any other suggestions, guys? Rashomon. Whew, I love Rashomon. I've seen it. It's fantastic. Even if your uh, pick doesn't happen today, um, I mean, I'm adding it to a big pile, but hey, maybe next week. Okay, so let's see. So, what do we got here? All right. Okay. What else? Anybody else? Anything else before I do it? Cinema Paradiso. Wow. Neo is going super classic. Cinema. I love that movie. I love that film. It reminds me of my childhood. It was me as a kid. Cinema Paradiso. It's just absolutely fantastic. Brazil. Oh my God. That is not happy. You said you wanted a happy movie. <laughs> That's not happy. Brazil is destructive. It's a great film. It's, uh, what's his name? This, this director, like, Brazil. Um, God, what's his name? Uh, Gillen, Gillen, Gillen. Gillen uh, damn it. Is, when I try to remember something real quick, I lose it. Terry Gilliam. I got it. Okay. Terry Gilliam, yeah. He's a cursed director. All his films have had disasters, including Brazil. I believe Brazil had a chair that he was sued for. Like, every film he's done has been a disaster. Poor guy. Anything else? Anybody got anything else? I think that's it. Okay. All right. We're nearing, it's almost nine o'clock. So let's do our, let's do the big uh, draw. Okay. So here's your new stuff. Okay. All right. Ready? Okay. Exciting? I'm excited. Let's see what we're going to watch next. I want classic film, classic, 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 more classic. These films are, I mean, Clockwork Orange is really classic, but this one is relatively new. Hopefully something classic. All right, here we go. Oh. Can you see it? Mm, I always struggle with this. There we go. The Graduate, my handwriting is Awful, and I'm not even a doctor, so I have no excuse. The gra <laughs> that doesn't look like the graduate, but that I swear that's what I wrote. <laughs> Looks like the graduate. <laughs> the graduate. Okay, so here's the fun part. I've never seen it. I actually have not seen the graduate. I've seen clips of it, and I'm obsessed with the soundtrack because I love Simon and Garfunkel, but I have not seen the graduate. It's one of those films that I've never seen. So um, there we go. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so before we go, give me your ratings in the comment sections for um, give me your ratings in the comment sections for uh, this movie. For me, Children of Men is a nine out of ten. It would be nine point five if it wasn't so depressing and it had more rewatchability. I just I think it's perfect, almost perfect in a lot of ways. So I love it. Um, so yeah, Mrs. Robinson. I've again I've I've seen that scene and I've seen a lot of scenes from The Graduate, especially in film school. Uh, but I've actually never sat down and watched the whole thing. This is really cool. It's the first movie we're going to do that I haven't seen. Imagine if I hate it. What are we going to do? Well, you're going to have to convince me if it's good. <laughs> uh, New x has never seen it. Cool. Okay. Well, it's a classic film. It's an iconic movie. Uh, Ahmed Suleiman hasn't seen it. Uh, Steven says it's a great one. I guess you have seen it. I want to make a suggestion, but I... No, no. 
<laughs> well, you can make a suggestion later. I mean, the stream is going to be live on YouTube. Uh, once I, I'm done, it's going to be up as a, as, a, as a long video. Please share, please like, please subscribe, please help me. I need engagement. I'm dying. <laughs> the YouTube algorithm is destroying me um, because I'm doing English content from an Arabic location. So <sighs> it's a mess. So uh, like, share, and subscribe. And uh, our next film is The Graduate. You have a couple of days. I'll probably go live on Monday, but I will confirm on uh, Facebook and on the event page. So go to Raz Reviews on Facebook, Raz Reviews Movie Club event on Facebook as well. Uh, and I'll post there when the next live is going to be, but probably going to be on Monday. Um, I need some time off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so The Graduate. Graduate. Here we go. Okay. So thank you guys. Uh, for sticking around. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it and uh, stay safe out there. Please um, Please don't go out stay at home stay safe and try to stay sane. <laughs> I hope watching a movie is helping you stay sane and um, I'll see you guys uh, next week Bye-bye